so why is it important to go back? I, I, just as you were finishing up the piece, mm. I, I mean, I can venture, I guess, but I think it's important to hear this from you. Mm. Why is it important to understand? I think we are now second, third, fourth generation. Right. Um, and we, we really are very separated from our um, cultural past in many ways. Um, we have a culture here, yes, but um, an American culture. But that's made up of, um, you know, a very big, uh, you know, bag, if you will, salad bowl, some people say, of Im uh, immigrants of di from different cultures. Sure. But why is it important hmm. to go back? And I think for, for us, um, as, as this country gets older and older and older, this is an important question to ask and to be able to answer and to sure. understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not just for this idea of like, let's celebrate multiculturalism, isn't it? Let's right. feel good about ourselves and right. how you know, diverse this culture is, or, or for personal enrichment. You know, right. I think for me, yeah, it's some of that, but it, it was also, the, the impulse was really to connect my children and hopefully my grandchildren and great-grandchildren with their history. Because if, if we don't reach back um, and we don't connect them to the place that our, our parents or grandparents came from, and we're in that pivotal generation that's no. that, that can still access those stories because our grandparents are still alive. Right. Then you do something of a disservice, not only to, to, to your kids, but I think also to you know how connected the world essentially is. That right. I want my son when he's reading about something happening in the Middle East, um, not to feel like it's this kind of alien place that he has no connection to. Or my great grandchildren. Wait a second, you know we not 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 all that long ago. You know, my great grandfather, great great grandfather, was living in a mud hut in those mountains. Right. Um, and I think the extent that we can kind of weave generations together across these this great geography, um, I think the world winds up uh, being a more tolerant place. I mean, maybe that sounds idealistic, but I actually believe in that. I think that the more that we can we, we can get people to see their lives as connected with someone else's lives halfway across the globe, uh, yeah. the world's better off. Yeah, and I think if they can understand that for themselves, yes. this is important because mm. um, the the internet and new media and the blogosphere is deciding that for them. It's sure. forcing them to understand that, and uh, not by choice. And if it could be either by choice or by understanding it themselves, um, you know, it might be better understood. So anyway, uh, let's hand it over to the audience. Yes. Please. <laughs> <laughs> you want, my name is Can you Wasti. stand up, Sunil? Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Suleiman Wasti from the Middle East Institute. I had the honor six months ago to visit the Citadel of Belgium. Oh, nice. And it mm. was a fascinating experience. It's uh, perhaps the oldest habitat, continuously habitat uh, uh, location going back to 5000 BC. And I was puzzled how you know it's mounted all the invasions, the <coughs> various <coughs> trials and tribulations. And I was my it was my it was a short trip. I was mm. in the UN. Then I visited Peshawar, which is close to my hometown in Pakistan. And there are Sikh temples, and there are Sikhs living with the Taliban. The only thing they have in common is a turban and a beard. But uh, <coughs> so the Sikh gentleman said. You know why we live together? It's a desire to live together and the allegiance to the land. Mm. Mm. And I think that gave me, I just wanted to hear your views on that. It's a fascinating. Yeah, topic. I mean, I, I think. Um, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think geography does play a very important role. I think, you know, one of the, I, I think that in many ways, if you look at the political structure of these villages, I don't mean political in a formal political system, but with the Aga, you know, the sort of chieftain um, at, at the top, and, you know, it was Muslim, obviously it was a Muslim majority. But I think in many ways, the loyalties were first to the land and to your village before they were to something outside of that. So in many ways, you were sort of a, a Kurd first and then, you know, a, a, a Jew or a Muslim uh, secondarily. And, and I think the Kurdish identity is largely defined um, is a geographical one. If you, it, there's no sort of common, uh, you know, uh, sort of racial history, if you will. You know, if you if you walk through Kurdistan, you'll see people with sort of Nordic blonde, blue-eyed features to very dark um, features. They've been conquered so many times, as as one scholar put it. 
you know, everyone who's come through there has been curtified beyond recognition. Um, and so it, there, I think the fact that they were isolated and that they were cut off from places where, where ideologies are created, you were loyal to your town. You contributed to your town. If, if, a, if, a, if a member of a, it did not say the blood didn't pour in Kurdistan, it did many, many times, but it wasn't necessarily uh, along religious lines. Um, it was, um, there, were, there was tribal warfare. So if, if, if um, a, a member of one village w was killed, Jew uh, or Muslim, the Aga from that village would, would seek revenge. You don't, ki you know, don't kill my people, don't kill my, they might use words like don't kill my Jews. They're a little bit paternalistic perhaps, but, um, I think that in many ways, uh, isolation bred tolerance, whereas if they were in big cities and universities where there are, you know, the, whatever the equivalent of think tanks are, or, you know, um, political groups that are seeking to divide people, or, and, um, then you might have had less tolerance. So while there are many curses of isolation, I mean, poor health care, not, not great educational system, um, one of the blessings was that it bred a kind of uh, tolerance where if, as long as you were a contributing member of your village, you could practice your own faith, you could speak your own language. I mean, the fact that Aramaic survived um, for 1,200 years after the Islamic conquest in Kurdistan tells you something, because even the Jews in Baghdad switched over in, to Arabic. They spoke Judeo-Arabic, they wrote, they wrote in Judeo-Arabic. 250 miles to the north, they never got the memo, and neither did the Christians. So the Christians and the Jews who were up in the mountains of Kurdistan um, continued to speak Aramaic, 1,200 years after everyone else switched to Arabic. And I think um, that tells you something about what you could get away with up there that you couldn't in the bigger cities. Absolutely. Yes, Kathy. Uh, okay, just, if you could just, sorry. Wait. Yeah. Thanks. I know you're saving some stories for us to read your book, but um, <laughs> interested in your description of what happened when you're in Iraq in 2004 with your father and, um, you know, the impressions and uh, what you wanted to talk about. Well, I think we were fearful at first because all we were doing was reading the, Amer the American headlines and there's a tendency to sort of lump I everything you hear about in Iraq in into, you know, apply it to the whole country. Um, but Kurdistan really is, I think, in many ways, as their own tourism campaign would, would have it, the other Iraq. Um, <laughs> that's their tourism slogan. I mean, it really... You know, we went through, we, we came in through Turkey. Um, we flew to Istanbul, then to Diyarbakir in the southeast, and then took a really frightening four-hour taxi ride down to the <laughs> Turkish border, not because there were soldiers or anything, but because of how fast and insane the cab drivers are <laughs> and that they're sort of playing chicken with these large oil tankers as you're getting down there. Um, but we were really blown away by um, how hospitable um, People were, I can't, we were sort of overwhelmed by invitations to eat with people, to, to drink tea with people. Um, a lot of the older generation remembered by name uh, and profession their Jewish neighbors, their business partners. They want to know how they were doing, where are they now. Yeah. One man said, tell your people to come back, we have room for you, um, we miss you, where, where have you gone, my brothers and sisters. I mean, there was this real sense of, of connection with the Jews, um, you know, because look, I mean, we're another group of people who for many years were surrounded by, by enemies um, and who aspired to have to, a sta to statehood and got it. Um, and so they feel a kind of common common ground, I think, with, with Jews that, that I had heard about from my dad, but I, I had sort of also as a, as a journalist kind of been suspicious of or skeptical of because I thought he was just being sentimental about it. But when we, when we actually got there, I, was, I, I think it, it bore out in the treatment uh, we received from from the locals, uh, which was very warm. We, you know, we, we were invited to weddings, um, these wonderful outdoor weddings with dancing and wonderful food. Um, and um, we really felt, uh, we really felt welcome in a way that um, surprised me. Yeah. It had changed a lot, I imagine, since your father had been there. It had this, um, yeah, I mean, the Jewish neighborhood is still there. So interestingly enough, you know, when um, Saddam was, sort of in, in charge of all of Iraq, um, he insisted that, that the Jewish Quarter be renamed. I, I suspect he did in many, many Kurdish towns to something like the Liberated Quarter or something. Um, but as soon as the Kurds went back to controlling their own fate uh, in, after the first Gulf War, they went back to calling it what they always had, which is the Mahalla Chuhiya, which is the Jewish neighborhood. So the Jewish Quarter is still there. It's sort of the, the 
you know, the poorer part of town, these sort of narrow winding alleys that um, carve through um, these kind of ramshackle houses. But some of the old structures still stand. The, some, the, the synagogue is still there. It's now used as a home by somebody. There, um, there were some Jewish, like, um, tablets that had, or the Hebrew tablets that had been embedded in the walls when my father visited for the first time in 92 um, that had now been removed and someone was storing them uh, in their house protecting mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. allegedly. He, I think he wants to actually sell them to a museum. And, <laughs> and somewhere in the West, he hasn't had much luck yet because it's hard to take like antiquities out of any country, and you shouldn't do it. Um, but the, um, so the Jewish neighborhood was still there. You know, my dad, it was the usual thing, like when somebody's like, the river seems so much smaller now. Um, my walk to, to school seemed like, you know, uh, miles and miles long, and we did, we did it in five minutes, you know. Um, and the river, the river is still, of course, still there, and that was, was such an important part of the geography for him. One of the things that was changing rapidly, and one of the reasons it's, it's changed, I think, more over the last 10 years than it had in the preceding 50, was you know the fact that the Habur border crossing with Turkey, which is you know two miles to the north, is sort of the safest and probably busiest land crossing into Iraq. So. As a result of that, there's a lot of money flowing into Zaha now, and there's new hotels. They're not fancy or anything, but the new hotels can tell you uh, how you know how many like brand new BMWs I saw driving through town with like video screens embedded in the back seats, people passing around $100 bills. So there's a lot of wealth coming there. And one of the things that, that really struck me about the pace of change was that in the Jewish neighborhood, when I went with my father in 2005, the streets looked the alleys, I should call them, looked very much like they did in my father's day. They were rutted, you know, dirt alleys with a little, like, tra small trench in the middle that wastewater fl flowed down. Went back a year later, I went back by myself in 06 because I, I wasn't done with my research. The, all those had been paved. So, like, literally, that, I mean, that one key feature of the landscape had changed in a year. And so you wonder about mm. the, what the pace is going to be going forward. Um, so I, I think that, I fear that, you know, that's why I think there is, when you ask, why do you want to, why should you go back, why should you capture these stories when you, because if you wait much longer, the history is not going to be there to be yeah. had. So that, this, that, that this for me, true. was the, that lent urgency to what Absolutely. I was doing. Absolutely. Yes, Cynthia. It, oh, here in, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm really curious. Is your dad still alive? A, yes. And okay, good. Mm -hmm. And um, B, have you seen um, the Last Temptation of Christ that's in Aramaic? Or no, uh, what is it called? Oh, passion. Yes, the Last Temptation. Of, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the pa yeah. All Do you right. Think it was accurate at all? Um, well, I, did, I actually confess that I have not seen. Um, I have not seen the whole thing. Um, but I can tell you about um, the how that that was done. I mean, my father, ironically enough, yeah. even though he's sort of the least glamorous of men, because we live in Los Angeles, he does get calls from movie studios and production studios from time to time to render actors' lines in Aramaic, either to write them out, transliteration, or to actually speak them. I think he did an he, but there always it's like weird stuff, like he did an episode of the X-Files, and he did like a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode, uh, enthusiasm episode in which a, a Hispanic uh, handyman named Jesus um, steps on a nail. Um, and so my father is asked to say something or to voice for him something along the lines of, ow, that really hurts in Aramaic. Um, so, um, and, he's, and, and, and he also, I think, did the movie, Oh God. Do you guys remember the George Burns movie, um, comedy, where George Burns appears on Earth as the supreme being uh, and makes himself visible to only one person, a hapless uh, supermarket manager played by John Denver. And so there's a scene in that, in that movie where, um, uh, a, a group of theologians who can't see God um, asked John Denver to administer a quiz to the Supreme Being in a language that only he can understand. And so that, my dad wrote the quiz, so you can see it very briefly. It's, uh, um, so, but, so, the, so the, the Mel Gibson movie, um, The uh, Passion of the Christ, is that what it is? Okay. Um, Mel Gibson did not come to my father for that, but he came to one of his colleagues, actually a man who was in his Graduate, graduating class at Yale, uh, a Jesuit um, hmm. father uh, named Father Falco, I believe, um, who's another Aramaic expert. So I don't know whether it was that he didn't want to work with a Jewish speaker of Aramaic. I don't know. You know we know it, how Mel Gibson feels about the Jews. Um, but uh, in that case, my father didn't get the call. <laughs> so, but I can tell you how the Aramaic in that movie. Uh, from what my, my father has seen of it, it is, even if you were an Aramaic speaker today, 
you would maybe understand a quarter of it because what he did is sort of a lot of lines you can't really s say in, in one dialect of Aramaic or from one era of Aramaic. So it's sort of a patchwork of Aramaic from different eras, different regions. And frankly, I don't think he was trying to like make a lot of money off the Aramaic you know, speaking audience. I think it was just an effort to lend a kind of authenticity yeah. and to it. And the last question yeah. has, did you ever find your aunt? Uh, you have to read the book, oh, um, and, if you, uh, and if you have read it and you still have questions, you can email me, and I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a teaser. Yes, I can we. I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to come to you next, but the, there's a gentleman in the back that waited mm -hmm. patiently for me the first. I'm sorry. Yeah. My name is Laser Berman at the American Enterprise Institute. I have two questions about language. Um, first of all, is the Aramaic that your father speaks uh, similar to Talmudic Aramaic? And do you get a sense of whether the Kurdish Jews were able to speak the surrounding Kurdish of their neighbors? Oh, yeah, good questions. Um, so, um, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the relationship between the Talmudic Aramaic and the um, Aramaic of today, and which is spoken by very few people, um, is, you know, think of the difference between, like, Old or Middle English and English. You know, it's basically the same language, but it's evolved, you know, so... Um, there are some significant differences, um, but you know the basic the basic structure and vocabulary is the same. Pronunciations have changed, some grammar has changed, new words. There's been infiltration from surrounding languages that have affected language, but basically it's the same same tongue. Um, and yes, I mean the thing about being a Jew or a Christian in Kurdistan is um, you had to be polylingual. You couldn't survive if you weren't. So. You spoke Aramaic uh, among yourselves in the neighborhoods, uh, in, in the churches and synagogues. Uh, when you had dealings with the Muslim majority, you would speak um, you would speak Kurdish, um, either Kermanji or, or Sarani, um, two dialects uh, of Kurdish. Um, and then if you went to the big cities, if you went to Mosul or Baghdad, you also spoke Arabic. Um, and so you really, language was not just something that you added to your resume to, to make yourself look you know, a little more sophisticated, you needed it as a matter of survival. So most of the Kurds, if they were going play anywhere, needed to speak uh, at least two, possibly three or four languages. I know something that was eye-opening yeah. for me when I went to southern Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. about 18 kilometers um, from the Syrian border a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, realizing that the Kurdish community there, so they speak Kurdish in their home, mm -hmm. or Arabic, and then Turkish outside. Yes, yes. Uh, and so this was, yeah, mm -hmm. very similar. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, I'm Jonathan Ratner. Uh, I was you know, obviously moved and, and struck by uh, the story of your father and his, his desire to keep words alive. And um, I was wondering whether music was something that hmm. also, in a different way, struck a chord, whether in terms of lullabies or in terms of uh, hmm. The way uh, Torah uh, would be chanted, which I'm sure would be yeah. quite different than anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean he was he's not a music he's not an ethnomusicologist. Um, there are others who have who have looked at Kurdish music and Kurdish dance, and there's some interesting things written about it. Um, but he certainly remembers the melodies, and in fact, would sing me uh, when I was a baby. He would sing me some Kurdish uh, lullabies, um, actually in Kurdish, not not even Aramaic. Um, and so, speaking of the infiltration between languages, um, and so that becomes a kind of mnemonic in a way, words and, and ideas from the culture are preserved that way. And I think one of his first, some of his earliest uh, academic papers were on, it, kept, it feels kind of like cheating because you're like, you're not leaving your house to do your homework, but he, he wrote, um, he wrote articles about nursery rhymes uh, in, in that the Kurdish Jews told each other, um, or, or um, idiom, idiomatic expressions or proverbs and one of the things that distinguishes my father from other uh, Neo-Aramaic, Ar Neo-Aramaic is a term for Aramaic spoken after the Islamic conquest, the sort of vernacular form that survived the death of Aramaic everywhere else. Um, what distinguishes my father from the other scholars is that he really has an interest not just in the language, but in the culture. And I've hung out with some of these linguists who are not from the culture. Eh, they're sort of interested in the culture, but they're really more interested in these sort of formal issues, issues of you know, morphology, phonology. Um, you know, syntax, it's a very kind of science, really. Um, but not, not for my father. My father's really on much more of a personal mission, so these things like nursery rhymes, um, they, you know, um, lullabies are, are much more important to him than they might be to other linguists. 
So where is your mom in all of this? Oh, that's a good question. And yeah. secondly, <laughs> um, how is uh, Seth uh, understanding he's going to be 10, right, right. this year? Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, you can't write a book called My Father's Paradise and not answer questions about um, your mother, especially from your oh, mother. Um, right. You, the, um, you know, it, I love her just as much for the record, um, but my mother has a more conventional story. She's my, my, actually, my father, my father uh, part of his immigrant journey was while he was at Yale University after his first year there, he went to New York City for a weekend, he was kind of really depressed. He was missing home. He was wondering why he'd ever come to America. It seemed like a place full of broken and depressed people who overshared and you know it was like it, tough tough for him yeah. um, and he was wanting to go back and he's he walks into uh, very depressed he walks into Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village sees a woman taking photographs of kind of the down and out bohemians who were in the Washington Square Park at the time and is kind of moved by her because she's you know she seems to care about sort of people in America who aren't making it America seemed like a place obsessed with success and a lot of people in the park reminded him of pe people from back home and so he's sort of interested in, in her, and he walks up to her with a very clumsy pickup line, something like, are you also a tourist? Um, which just had a lot of women running in the other direction, but he very quickly recovered by mentioning two things. One, that he was Jewish, and number two, that he was at Yale, and they wound up talking for four hours and then were married four months later. Um, and their love stories actually celebrated my second book, which is called um, yes. Heart of the City, which is a collection of New York City love stories, including theirs. But uh, beside the point. So that, that um, my mother has a more conventional story. She, is, um, a Eastern, she has Eastern European Jewish roots, very conventional story. Her, her like, grandfather came to New York City through Ellis Island, worked his way up from like newspaper hawker on the street corner to um, you know, got, and then got into the textiles business. So, um, uh, and so she kind of served as my father's kind of um, liaison to the West in many ways, like, uh, and to his children, um, my, you know, and the translator in, in some ways. I mean, explaining my father to us and explaining us to my father. I mean, the kids in, in, in Kurdistan did not behave the way his two bratty sons behaved. I mean, we, we, were not, we were not the greatest kids. We were pretty badly behaved and didn't show the kind of respect that it, uh, uh, children showed to their parents in, over there. And my father was pretty gracious about it. I think he held a lot in. Um, but um, my mother was kind of the bridge between those two worlds and also just did basic stuff for my father. My father can be a bit of the air, you know, airhead about things that have nothing to do with his field, like balancing a checkbook, remembering to get to his dental appointments on time, um, you know, all the, the basic stuff that wouldn't come naturally to you if you were from if you grew up in the culture, he did. Um, so she she played a very important role, and is um, uh, and it doesn't get fully reflected in the book. Maybe if I wrote, if I write another introduction at some point, I might throw a little bit more for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. And Seth. And Seth, uh, okay. yeah, he's. I mean, I think he is. Um, he he is. He when he was growing up, I remember he he knows that he's in the book. There's actually like a photo of him from behind at one point um, in the book, and. Um, he would want us to read him the parts that he's in, so that's where he's sort of at now. Um, but he's, you know, he 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 his, he he plays. He when my, when my, he and my father have a really wonderful relationship. And if you if you go to my uh, website and you click on writings, there's a piece I wrote about their relationship for the New York Times Modern Love section that talks about how how they get along. So they spend a lot of time together. You know, he knows um, where my where my father comes from. He knows he knows. Um, uh, and my father ta has taught him some of the marble games they used to play in, in Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, and um, and he's now going. He's now uh, goes. He's learning Hebrew um, at, at a Sunday school here in um, in D.C. So, you know, we're we're figuring it out sort of day day to day. Um, but he, I very much want him to, you know, to to connect with the culture and to connect with the heritage. And I think he's doing that already with Hebrew. And I think he'll do more of it as he gets older. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Any, okay, yeah. one more question. My name is Mohammed. I'm a law student at DC. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about how the Kurdish Jews are doing today in Israel compared mm -hmm. to the times when your father went there. Yeah, I mean, they're, the Kurdish Jews in Israel now are doing a lot better. I mean, they came over as, as workmen. You know, they, were, they worked on construction sites, they were porters, they would like, do things like carry pianos up narrow staircases, taxi drivers. Um, and like any immigrant group, they, you know, the next generation did a little bit better, and the one after that did better still. Um, so, 
you know, they're not, are there many of them in the highest levels of politics? No, not yet. There's still, there still is a sort of an Ashkenazi Sephardic divide in mm-hmm. Israel with the Ashkenazi being sort of higher on the pecking order um, in many ways. And there's still, there's still bigotry uh, directed at Jews from the Middle East gen- generally. But I think it's changing, I think it's getting better. Um, and now you have, I mean, some of the Kurdish Jews who went into the construction business as laborers in the 1950s now own, now are owners of big construction companies and are you know, probably millionaires. Um, so they've done very well in business and are kind of working their way up through the other professions. And I think it's just a matter of another generation or two where people won't see them as any different. Um, but I think it's unfortunate. I mean, it bothers me that, that, that um, that there are still distinctions being made. I feel like, I mean, just as a Jew, I feel like I hold our, my own people to a higher standard, partly because Jews understand perhaps better than, than a lot of people the sometimes murderous consequences of ethnic distinction. And so to come to Israel after, after what we went through in the Holocaust and in, in Europe, and to continue to claim that, you know, some Jews were more worthy than others troubled me. And I didn't really know this going in. It's not an ideological book. It's a, it's, a, it's a story of a family. But one of the things that I think that comes out of it is this idea that the welcome mat was smaller in Israel for some groups of Jews than it was for, for others. And I, I do think, having said that, I do think it's getting better now. This is a mm. problem of human beings, you know. Yeah, it is. And right. this is, and unfortunately, yes. and our memories yeah. are short. Time. Yes. Yes. So, mm. um, yeah. And you see it in many, many cultures in which Absolutely. people I make mean, distinction because someone's... Say it in, yeah. Shade of their skin color is slightly Absolutely. different than, than someone else's, and it's, I think it is an unfortunate part of human nature, but something that we can try to, to correct yes. for. Yes, yes. Um, so. And our communities mm-hmm. call us, our religions, our cultures mm-hmm. call us to a higher yes. you know, level of consciousness, mm-hmm. I think, um, that we should all strive to attain. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, mm-hmm. and please uh, thank Ariel. All right.